for uh, the survivors of this uh, afternoon. I will not speak in uh, Italian. Uh, neither in French. So I hope I will make you uh, stay awake. And I'm going to uh, describe, uh, obviously, uh, given the investment that we have put in this effort, which extends for now up to 15 years, with maybe 50, I don't, I don't count anymore, 70 papers, um, I, I'm going, obviously, to be, able, to be only able to scratch the surface and present the main, some main ideas, but not being able to show you the technicalities. I will refer a, a bit. Uh, on it as we go along. So I'm, I want to discuss what I think has been missing um, in these discussions until today, until now, and I try to uh, fill that gap, which is that clearly, yes, markets exhibit crises, exhibit instabilities, and so on. Um, mechanisms have been discussed, which I would qualify are more uh, structural on the short time scale time scale of uh, seconds, minutes, uh, maybe hours, maybe week. The key question to me is actually are they really coming like this out of the blue and can we understand um, whether there are processes that prepare the crisis to occur? Uh, we heard yesterday and today that, yeah, I mean, we can understand a lot about this uh, crisis when they do happen. But the question is, how do they mature? Are there maturation processes? And so this, of course, asks the question how financial market works. And very clearly, very quickly, uh, to set up the landscape, the standard picture is that you have information flowing to the system. And of course, and the efficient engine of the stock market is to transform this information to price, which is the standard efficient market hypothesis, where price are just reflecting news. As the opposite, extreme opposite, you have this concept of endogeneity or reflexivity, if I borrow the term of Soros, where basically you have everything controlled by feedback loops and relatively minor influence from the flow of news. And I want to today present um, quantitative evidence and what are the understanding, our understanding of the mechanism underlying this um, endogeneity, that how we call it, that we think, we see, and I will show you example from time scale of decade to time scale of seconds or less, from uh, uh, big bubble formation and crashes to the uh, flash crash, for example. So the fact that the efficient market hypothesis uh, has a problem has been, of course, uh, documented for a long time. Um, I can mention the first um, really uh, interesting uh, evidence called the excess volatility puzzle. Uh, by Schiller at the uh, 20, now 31 years ago, where uh, the market were are found very clearly to fluctuate much more than its fundamental calibration uh, would um, uh, predict based on, let's say, cash flows or dividend and so on. Uh, other types of studies, and there are hundreds of papers of this type, um, have been trying to uh, match large market moves to large news in the sense of you know, major announcement, um, Kennedy's assassination, uh, Kardec, um, Eisenhower, Kardec arrest, and things like that, uh, Kardec uh, crisis, and so on, and other macroeconomic geopolitical events. And the evidence has been uh, not clear at all where most of the big market moves are not associated with so-called big news that you would a priori justify. And this seems to carry over to uh, high-frequency trading, and here I'm just borrowing from the group of Bouchot, who showed that indeed, when comparing high-frequency uh, price change with high-frequency news, as you can measure the thousands of news from Reuters, Bloomberg, you find very little correlation between uh, these news flows and the market um, price change. And also you find you can quantify the response function or relaxation of volatility after the jumps that occur. And you find that for the few cases, a small fraction of cases where the market does react to news, the relaxation is quite different between those cases where there is uh, exogeneity as qualified by the fact there was a clear news coincident with a price change, as opposed to the so-called endogenous jumps, where there is no such coincidence. It's very hard to find um, any uh, correlation. So 
I want to build on this, and um, let me start with um, stating a bit the philosophy that is underlying, that is the summary of this research that we have been carrying out over the years in, in my group, which is the realization that the crisis are the norm rather than the exception. So we don't have an efficient market which is in equilibrium stable, but actually crisis are basically the norm. It's a bit similar to the Minsky um, instability hypothesis. And we also claim or find that most crises are endogenous. Even the Russian crisis uh, in August 1998, we could foresee it by the type of methodology that I'm going to describe to you, as opposed, that, uh, as opposed to the, um, let's say, um, um, uh, conclusion that it was, you know, a pure Russian uh, default, partial default on these debts, the value of the rubble, that spilled over to uh, stock markets in, uh, let's say, DAX, German market, or US. We see it as much more endogenous in the sense that, indeed, political decisions are not uh, done in a vacuum, but they are actually um, coupled to stock market valuation and so on, and the depth aspects and so on. We also claim that bubbles, things that have not been really discussed today, have been mentioned, are the key drivers. They are, we think, the, um, in, the agents preparing for the crisis to develop. And that's very, very important to consider. And there are some of the driver that, the drivers that uh, I just uh, would like to have three slides making this point. It's very difficult to read, but I, it is just a compilation of some quotes that have been published by two successive chairmen, Greenspan and Bernanke, which basically show, and this has been taken by the press and so on, that the Fed and the central banks more generally do care a lot about stock markets and do care a lot about the wealth effect. Um, and this is a kind of third or fourth hidden mandate of subtle banks, which is to um, have the stock markets uh, go up again so that everybody feels richer, firms can re-access um, um, markets to get funding and so on and so forth. We have, for example, uh, performed a certain number of uh, calibration tests economic trust that shows that indeed if you compare the politics of the setting of the federal fund rates as well as the other rates that, you, that derive from it and you do um, different exercises to look at the co-dependences between these different um, time series, you find basically, and this is summarized by the kind of uh, um, uh, daring title, slaving of the Fed to the stock market, that actually the Fed reacts to the stock market rather than the, the reverse. In the textbook standard view, you would have you know, the standard bank policy uh, changing the cost of capital to the economy that spill over to the price of the stock market and so on. So you have a kind of causality arrow from the central bank to the stock market. We find exactly the opposite. And we find it by simple measure of cross-correlation as opposed to, and as well as much more sophisticated method when we look at a variety of different um, rates um, compared with the uh, stock market. So you can see a little bit with your eyes. I don't want to spend time on this, but we have a series of papers, like um, four papers, that document this very strong correlation between, or dependence, better said, because it's not linear correlation, dependence between uh, stock market and rates with a causality, with a lag, which may be varying with the lag going from stock markets to, to the Fed um, strategy. So continuing on the key proposition, not only the bubbles are the key drivers, but we want to understand where do they come from. And we have been, been discussing uh, in the last one day um, different uh, feedback processes, and in particular procyclicality, that we claim also works not only at the time scale of hours or days in fire sales, as Rama was discussing this uh, morning, but also at the time scale of months to years. And this gives rise to, obviously, unsustainable um, regimes um, so, and leads to regime shift, which can be actually captured quite nicely by the mathematics of what we call stochastic finite times uh, singular processes. Uh, and this leads also to the very interesting possibility of developing diagnostic of these non-system processes and with um, the possibility to develop probabilistic um, diagnostic of the time of the change of regime. So this kind of a complementary to some of the talks that we have this, uh, heard today by taking this much longer view and uh, trying to put a non 
time invariance approach in a sense. Not only uh, it's very dangerous to assume, as Rama was uh, pointing out, that uh, stationary exists on stock market, bounce time series, but also the market actually develops phases which are like flying out of the fog suddenly where visibility is observable and the fragility of it becomes quite evident. Of course, um, in order to put this into big shape, we can go to the, uh, here I, I go to the study of uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff. Uh, who uh, published this uh, book and these papers on 800 years of um, financial crisis and sovereign crisis, with the title, This Time is Different, um, emphasizing that nothing is different, really. Um, and these two uh, plots show that at any time when you look at major countries, I think they examine more than 100 countries in the world over here, you see 200 years of history, you find that anywhere from 10 to 50% of the countries were in a sovereign or default restructuring problem. Um, and not, of course, not just the emerging countries, but um, developed countries like Japan, Sweden, Canada, and so on and so forth. So this is more the norm than the exception. And um, looking at the banking crisis, the bottom uh, graph shows a level of measure of globalization through capital mobility in red and an uh, intensity measure of the banking crisis, which coincided with the two peaks. Uh, the first peak happened uh, around the First World War, uh, or actually developed until the Great Crash and the Great Depression. Then there was a, a quiet, calm period, and then a resumption of this uh, globalization as well as the severity of crisis. And you see here um, a bottom which actually shoots up, of course, uh, with, if we take into account the present crisis. Uh, I find no better uh, data than this one to illustrate the normality of crisis. This is the Hang Seng, so this is a kind of uh, um, uh, flying a bit uh, less high and going to look at only 30 years of data, of the Hang Seng Hong Kong Index, um, which, uh, by the way, I remind you, the Hong Kong, by its regulation, is, has been the freest market of the world in terms of capital and regulations. So it is really the closest approximation to the textbook example of free, free market. And what do you see there happening? Well, you see that um, in the log scale linear in time, you have a straight line that is approximately corresponding to a rate of return of the market of a buy and hold strategy, which is close to 14% a year. But the market never follows this. What it does, he picks and crashes, picks and crashes. Eight, eight, uh, these eight arrows correspond to a crash of more than 15% in less than three weeks. And there are each of them, as you can see in the bottom, uh, with some speaker analysis that we'll come back to uh, later, preceded by this kind of upward curvature, kind of uh, reflection of the positive feedback that the rate of return increases itself. It's not like an exponential growth. We tend to think of bubbles as exponential exploding prices, no, what is happening is super exponentially exploding prices in the sense that the rate of return, which would be constant, would qualify um, an exponential growth, grows itself in this case. So that's quite the question, and this is exactly the, the first um, message I would like to uh, share with you, or summarizing, is this question is, what is a bubble? I mean, it's, it's, a very, it's, it's, it's supposed to be a very simple uh, question, but actually it's very difficult because most of the studies um, uh, conclude that, yeah, I mean, we see really clearly bubbles, and others say, no, we can explain exactly the same uh, data, the same behavior by just doing a change of calibration of the model, explaining uh, the um, uh, price, so-called anomalies or bubble, by simply changing or tuning the parameters. And this is a review paper um, which um, state this, that for each paper where there is a finding of evidence for bubble, there is another one that fits the data equally well without allowing for a bubble. And this, comes, this can be traced back to these two problems of qualifying a bubble by an exponential explosive growth, but everything in economics is exponentially growing. So you have then to argue what is the correct rate of return, and then you have to invoke valuation formula which are extremely sensitive to the parameters. For example, the Gordon Shapiro uh, formula that uh, says that the price is the dividend, the price of an asset, or an equity is the dividend divided by the rate of discount minus the gross rate of the dividend, P equals D over R minus G. You change a little bit the denominator variable, you have a factor two. Uh, Black famously said, if you know the final price between 50 and 200, you, will be, you should be happy. 
So this is one reason why it's so difficult to actually um, agree upon the definition of Babon, except as Griezmann concluded in his um, closing talk in a special conference organized to try to understand the dot-com crash, when the crash confirms that there was a bubble. So basically, he said, and during this dot-com uh, expansion, where just the NASDAQ component uh, value just was multiplied not by two, not by five, by 11 in just two years, just the birth, he said, confirms that the bubble was existing. So this is a sorry state of understanding if we still are in here. And I think it's a mammoth, really, in the shop that we need to really address in this. So what is a bubble? Is it expo exponentially exploding price? No, not only. Is it exploding volatility? So there are some um, models, and one prominent set of mechanism is the one uh, proposed by uh, Jarrow and his group, quite uh, well-known uh, financial economist who says, yeah, I have now the silver bullet to predict uh, financial uh, crashes because, um, and actually to identify bubbles and crashes are just the burst of the bubble which has reached such high level that the market becomes unstable by simply monitoring volatility and it has a specific um, uh, diagnostic which is basically a measure, an integrated measure of the path of uh, diverging volatility, something roughly like this. Now, the problem is that when you look at many cases, and now we have a working paper with 50, roughly 50, um, and we are adding on it cases of bubbles confirmed by the great crash that, uh, that, uh, that occurred, we find that in most of these cases, both implied volatility or historical volatility did not grow. It did grow during the expansion of the stock market over a time scale of five years, you know, three years or one year. You see burst of volatility, then quiet phase, volatility goes down, up again, down, as the market shoots up. But the crash occurs in general at the dip of volatility. Very, very bad precursor. It's true that many savvy investors know that there's something weird, that the market is properly overappreciated, and there are ways of selling. But then nothing happens, there's no crash, and there's no new rally and the crash occurs. So you, you cannot use, really, the volatility as a predictor. It's very bad. This is an example that shows, actually, the implied volatility uh, before the great crash of just 25 years ago. <laughs> Today, 25 years ago, when the market in the US dropped by 19, between 19 and 20%, uh, okay, for the Dow Jones, I think, oh no, for the SP 500, more 22 for the Dow Jones. And you see that the implied volatility just before the crash was at the flat, you know, EEG, brain, zero, no precursors. And then shoots up at the time of the crash. It's not a precursor. It's an aftershock, very clearly. And it took a few months to relax back. Another example that the volatility is a very bad precursor is to look at this so-called great moderation in the world of Bernanke. I think you introduced the term. And these are four uh, data which support that indeed, I mean, things were going very, very well until 2006, 2007. Whatever measure you were looking at, except depths, um, were fantastic. And for example, you look at the variance of inflation, the uncertainty uh, export of inflation as a function of uh, variance of, um, what is it, this? Of, uh, Output, thank you. Yeah, you can read better than me. Or, yeah, the, this is a number measure of the GDP growth rate or the volatility of the stock market and so on, or the distribution of the last 10 years compared to a long um, time average. You find all these measures were saying, you know, employment is great, no inflation, no uncertainty inflation, uh, no uncertainty on GDP, GDP is constant. I mean, everything is great. This is a new economy, we are the master of the world, and then the great uh, recession came. So volatility growth is clearly not a precursor. Of course, uh, now what would you say Jaro believes in it? I mean, what I've understood what he does is that he includes the time of the crash in his estimation, and of course at the time of the crash, the volatility shoots up, then his indicator of course shows a danger, but you're already in the eye of the hurricane. And this is a kind of cartoon summary of what I think is happening, and we see that in many, many models, from models of agents, 
of stock market um, dynamics or models of neurons interacting the brains where when you have decoupling of different uh, subsets, you have a kind of distribution of risk of losses of even sizes, which is of certain type. When the coupling starts, and you can think of this, for example, as an example of investment banking, commercial banking, retail banking, insurance, they are separated after the Glass-Steagall Act, and then they are progressively integrating their activity, what is well known from many models is that the distribution of risk becomes narrower, so you have indeed an expression of a system which is more stable, apparently, but concomitantly with this, you have what I call a dragon king, so a systemic size event, like a, um, an eigenvalue of the stability problem that becomes of the scales that the size of the economy. And of course, because you only measure this, you have no idea that there is a systemic instability. But this is systematic of what we understand. And um, I brought with me um, a book, actually, where, where we can try to um, it here to examine this uh, uh, one of the concept of um, systemic instability in a variety of systems. As you see here, that we apply it not only to financial system, social system, but geoscience, meteorological, material science, medicine, and other sciences, the idea that there's a common um, process going on through these lines, which is indeed as coupling emerge and stronger and stronger, and as diversity uh, decreases, you have the emergence of these uh, massive systemic uh, events. And I like to summarize these uh, thousands of papers in different fields by this phase diagram where you can think of the problem as um, along these two lines, two dimensions. One is the level of heterogeneity or diversity of the constituents. Could be agents, could be style of uh, investment and, or diversification, whatever, management. Um, and the level of uh, coupling or interaction between them. So, a priori, so of course, um, uh, this is uh, a simple way of thinking of summarizing a very complex diversity of problems, but I think it's a first order view that is very useful. So, basically, when you have um, a low uh, coupling coupled system with a lot of diversity, you have basically incoherent small fluctuation as you start to go up. In increasing the coupling, you have maybe a regime which has been called or dubbed self-organized criticality, where you have this kind of scaling, scale-free distribution of avalanches and events. But as the coupling increases further, you have this systematic, uh, systemic synchronization and extreme risk. I think that earthquakes belong to this rupture of uh, industrial, uh, industrial material and so on belong to this stock market belong to this regime. And the brain in between, we see evidence from experiments. We are collaborating with uh, teams who record for weeks what is going on in the brain of humans and rats and so on. And we see evidence that uh, um, depending on the case and situation of control parameter, you can be on this side or this side. And the main point is to try to understand, I believe, the fact that you have a large domain of the uh, control parameters, heterogeneity and interaction, which give rise to these systemic instabilities, which in finance are made by these bubbles. And the universal scenario of a bubble is uh, shown by this cartoon where you have the behavior of the va uh, valuation as a function of time from a first phase, an awareness phase, um, a mania phase, let's say, and a blow-up phase. And this can be described as it be already mentioned um, in previous talks. And here I just summarized very simply where you have um, introduction of a new innovation, a displacement, a recovery from a very prudent phase, then progressive increase of credit creation that um, loops on itself by uh, providing cheaper credit that fits in the economy, that leads to a um, domain of euphoria, and then a critical stage, which then gives to the crash and the revolution. There are many, many factors that propel uh, market bubbles. Here are only 14. Um, I will show more specifically mechanism. Um, there are many reasons why bubbles are not disappearing and come again and again. And actually, our research, and um, I think I will not have time to uh, discuss the present bubbles now. If you have questions, I would be happy to. Uh, but we see an epoch where, um, as a bubble hunter, um, we are very happy. I mean, this is a place where there is no scarcity of this ecology of animals. They are coming more and more, even after the Great um, uh, Recession. 
There are many reasons why they are not arbitrage away that, be, as, that has been discussed in the literature, from limits of arbitrage to no, by those traders, problem of synchronization, short list constraint, and so on and so forth. And indeed, when we look at the history, empirical history, we see that um, since, let's say, 1980, the world has been punctuated by bubbles at a rate that has been increasing. I will come back to this point. Now, let me go a bit more after this general introduction to the mechanism behind the bubbles. Basically, as I said, positive feedback. This is a common social uh, behavior. We all know and clapping, which starts uh, incoherent and then very clearly in concert and so on, uh, becomes coherent through positive feedback in the uh, processes um, uh, of the brain processing of the noise and so on. So this has been studied even quantitatively. For bubbles, the positive feedback, which I'm, I'm going to detail a bit more, give rise to enhancing returns, growth of returns, not just of price, as I mentioned, which is faster than exponential characteristics, together with a certain type of dynamics on the volatility, which is not systemically increasing. And as I said, it can be captured by this mathematics of finite time singularity. I should mention for the economists here in the, in the room that I think that this type of um, models have been underused or not used at all or very, very little. Uh, for example, in the, in the book uh, of um, Romer on endogenous economic growth, there is a, just a footnote saying, yes, there are a lot of positive feedbacks. Uh, this gives rise to mathematical monsters that blow up in finite time. They are very interesting. And he said, actually, very open, he said, it's not because they are you know, uh, blowing, blowing up in finite time that we should reject them. They may indeed describe for a while the dynamics of a reality. But of course, we should not extrapolate all the way to singularity because nothing goes to infinity. And I think the error of the community has been always, and maybe uh, uh, economists sometimes are too much frustrated mathematicians, they want absolutely to impose existence in their model, while this type of solution, this type of models, only have existed for a while. And I think this is a very important uh, generalization to consider, to consider a class of models for which solution can disappear after a while. And it's very interesting because it shows, and this is a way mathematically to actually capture, that there is a change of regime, which a time, a time non-invariance aspect. So this is what basically uh, is undermining or un underpinning this um, uh, behavior preceding each of these peaks that I showed here with the eight arrows. This uh, finite time singular model that come from positive feedback are all over the place when you look in science, from planet formation in solar system, from the PDE that describe uh, yeah, turbulence uh, in the limit of a very small uh, viscosity, from general relativity to the formation and finite time of black holes, to the dynamics of plasmas in tokamak, you know, for fusion, to, for rupture material failure, the dynamic of earthquake inception, models of uh, chemotaxis of biology, surface instability and the formation of uh, snowflakes or, or um, uh, source particles, to even the coin, it's called the Eurodix, settling in finite time uh, before, um, uh, with an infinite number of hits to the ground, and I believe stock markets. Now, what are these positive feedback? So this is probably a non-exhaustive list of this positive feedback. There are of two types. One is um, technical uh, and rational, I would say. The other one is more behavioral. In terms of technical and rational, many, many. Hedging, insurance portfolio have been discussed. Uh, bid as press response, uh, learning, procyclicity of financing, credit access, trend following, algorithmic trading, asymmetric information, portfolio execution, and so on. So all this, when you look in detail, that uh, simple replication, the simple replication of option, uh, option payoff give rise to procyclicality and positive feedback. Now, uh, Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, regulation, yes. Uh, the behavioral mechanism, are, I think, during the... But I'm... I'm um, uh, yes. Uh, but I'm thinking of the development of the bubble. So when things go well, or are thought to, be, to, to go well, that's when the... Reg and, and indeed, that's um, played a significant role because we had in 99 the repel of the Glastigal Act and the Grimm Act and so on, which was part of the whole story. Yes, thank you. I will add it next time. Um, 
in terms of behavioral mechanism, um, imitation, herding, is something that we cannot neglect. There are a lot of evidence in the market that there are imitation processes, and actually it can be shown to be the optimal strategy in the presence of finite cognitive abilities, finite computational power, and finite access to information, which I think would summarize basically everyone on this universe. Um, we see this imitation uh, studied a lot in psychology. We learn by imitation. Uh, we also see it in uh, uh, machine learning, and the most sophisticated softwares use imitation in order to adapt better and to provide better um, responses to uncertainty. There is also this um, mechanism of information cascade that has been also discussed in uh, financial uh, literature. This is a general finance paper that shows very interestingly that the savvy, so, uh, suppose savvy hedge fund and mutual fund managers actually heard in their portfolio allocation depending on their geographical area. So basically by sharing the same cocktails or the same bars and so on, they influence each other and therefore this uh, so-called global village has a very local village effect. And uh, a lot of uh, biological studies on anthropological studies show that, suggest that actually our brain is really hardwired to imitate, even probably over imitate, which led to very efficient um, strategies at the time when we were hunter gatherers in the savannas, but give rise to maybe excesses in the modern savanna, which are the stock markets. Now, we have, uh, yes. Yes. I have much less incentive to be original and make Yes. Profit. No, no, I mentioned it. I, meant, I mentioned that, of course, you can show that it is rational to imitate. If you, uh, imitation is just a way of efficient pulling. No, no, but it's also, if, it's also a risk management. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can derive it, math yeah, you, you can derive mathematically at the optimal strategy uh, in order to best predict the, the behavior of the market. Uh, for example. Huh? So, okay, so um, how to formalize that? Because of limited time, and I want to cover more the conceptual aspects of this research, I just want to mention that we have been building a set of uh, models based on extension of the Blanchard Watson rational expectation bubble models, putting it noise traders who uh, are coexisting with, uh, let's say, more optimizing traders with uh, different utility functions and taking into account the social imitation with myopic views and imitation processes. And we have basically two big classes of models we have been playing with, where the imitation process herding work on the uh, crash hazard rate, the probability for a crash to occur given that it has not yet occurred. And then the no arbitrage condition comes into the remuneration that has to emerge in order to remunerate the investors uh, to take the risk of being exposed to the crash, and an important aspect of these models is, of course, that the crash may not occur. So the bubble develops, there is a boom in price, but it is rational to stay invested because the crash is not a certain event. It only has a finite probability cumulatively over the time to appear. Another class of models is to take into account positive feedback on the return itself as a function of all the coupled parameters, and then it's translate to a um, kind of finite time singularity that is never rich in price because there's a crash that will appear before and uh, slow down the, the price. And so you have again the uh, no arbitrage condition that links the crash hazard rate to the rate of return. Uh, we add to this some uh, evidence of the network uh, a hierarchy and we have a certain number of arguments to suggest that there is a kind of discrete hierarchy uh, controlling the different agents and how they interact. This can be actually uh, and, um, pinned to probably the way we think in terms of collaborations, like we have a click group, we have a sympathy group, we have uh, different layers of uh, closeness of the uh, people we interact with, and this may indeed relate to um, a network structure of, um, of a certain type. This can be also derived uh, I just mentioned here that uh, if you uh, take um, models of agents which respond um, with um, value investment in a nonlinear threshold type way, to, uh, coexisting with um, uh, uh, 
uh, noise traders using myopic strategies, which are more trend following, but with nonlinear threshold also behavior, and you take into account the inertia, then you get also a hierarchy of scales. This is also another example showing that this onion type hierarchy of scales has been seen in the FedWire interbank payment network, where you look at the, here the distribution, so the probability distribution, uh, estimated through an Instagram method, of the number of links between different banks in this uh, Fed wire system. And when you see this some standard um, power law distribution showing that a few dominate, but you see also six layers of this onion, six layers of hierarchy, which is very, very clearly, you, you can do uh, some uh, calibration method to show that indeed, like Fourier transform or whatever in this scale and show very clearly the six layers that appear. So we put that together and we have um, now a, a set of models to try to calibrate and diagnose these bubbles. Now, I've been putting a lot of emphasis on bubbles because now the crisis, the crash itself, the crash, the, the, the panics and so on that we have been hearing about today and yesterday are not coming from a fat finger or from some decision coming out of the blue in this framework, but they are just simply the result of a maturation towards the instability, which is, not, which is the development of the bubble itself. So in the same way that if I take um, um, a pen and put it in my finger, I can always find and describe the proximal dynamics and proximal explanation why it is going to tilt one way or the other, which is basically the talk that we have been hearing the last two days. I claim that the most important question or the most interesting question is the fact what, what made this pen being in an upright position from in the first place, which is the fundamental reason for the instability. And the fundamental reason of the instability is that the bubbles have been developer, developing through these positive feedback processes that can be actually um, uh, known. So we have these log periodic power law models and many extensions. So I just mentioned three, six classes of extensions where we um, uh, develop these models in the present. And so it's interesting because we can calibrate at the same time the bubble component and the final value. Um, we take into account the fact that the singular time can be stochastic. Um, and this is associated with the um, um, Abreu-Bernemeyer lack of synchronization problem where we see in our framework not as a lack of synchronization in the estimation of the beginning of the bubble, which I think is extremely difficult, of course, but in the end of the bubble, which is much more realistic because every, most of the savvy investors know that there is something fishy about bubble developing, but they don't know when it's going to end. If you come back to the uh, statement of Greenspan in 1996 about the irrational exuberance of the market, Okay, that was a kind of statement by the Fed that something was going on in 1996. It took another three and a half for the bubble to really develop, explode, and then crash. So you have this uh, question of uh, synchronization to arbitrage the presence, known presence of a bubble. So excuse me, was there a bubble in 1996? There was No, it was just beginning. So I will show you. There wasn't a bubble in 1996. No, uh, okay, wait, wait until the end. Because my, my point is that the bubble started roughly in 1995. So the bubble is something, I mean, it, it is at the core of the question of what is a bubble. But let's wait to have the full picture and then maybe start in the discussion. Um, then we uh, take into account, so the problem of estimating bubbles is that you have residuals and um, there's a technical aspect in estimating the bubbles. Uh, which um, has to do with the self-consistency of the residual, so we have a set of uh, models to take that into account. And we take also into account the fact that positive feedback can also go, as we heard uh, earlier uh, today, uh, in, the, in, the, in the downward spiral, and we interpret even the Lehman Brothers as not the triggering event, but as actually part of the story of a downward spiral that started earlier, easily three, six months earlier, and just as a kind of last act of the process of a maturation of what we call a negative bubble, in the sense that it is exactly the symmetric of a bubble towards uh, downward pricing through the same type of mechanism. So what are the methodology for diagnostic bubble that I'm going to show you in the remaining of the time? Is positive feedback, as I said, of higher return anticipation, give rise to this uh, faster than exponential price, finite term singularity behavior, together with taking into account the negative feedbacks of value investors, of crash expectation that actually develop during the bubble. 
with the kind of accelerating of volatility, but accelerating of the frequency of volatility change, but not of the amplitude. These are a few examples of how uh, price looks like during famous bubbles, uh, which we have actually estimated ex ante with advanced diagnostics that were published between six and one year in advance in um, different publication forum or international archive. Uh, this one, the Chinese uh, bubble culminating roughly in December 2007, uh, was followed by something like a 70% drop before the Olympic Games of August 2008. And this is a case which um, I found in my uh, own research particularly interested because, interesting because I presented this um, diagnostic around this time, at the dash line time, to, in Stockholm, to a conference gathering 200 macro hedge funds. These guys are, you could arguably um, uh, say that they are the most motivated investors in the world. They, are, they can make billion in their own pocket if they are successful. They are huge high of higher power. Uh, they are best informed, and they try to have views on the market. So I presented in a kind of uh, a dinner talk this um, evidence, and I, so I was basically showing them this and telling them this data, this is what was happening, and this, of course, I was telling them that, yes, we think there's a bubble, and we think that the turning point will be toward the end, December or January, February 2008. And you know, you know what they told me? They told me it's impossible. It's impossible. The Olympic Games is coming uh, in, in, in China, so the ch Chinese government is going to do everything it takes to actually stabilize and so on. So actually, our uh, diagnostic was uh, time-wise incorrect because three weeks after my talk, the market tumbled 20%, uh, then somewhat stabilized, and then the dynamic was much more complex and things like that. But in terms of the main message that it's possible to identify, diagnose, and instability, I think this is one case among many that we have documented over the years. This is another very also delicate and a very interesting case, which is the so-called oil bubble, according to our methodology, that peaked in July 2008. And I remember Krugman was very adamant that it was just a supply-demand process, this guy rocketing oil, and we were, according to our methodology, identifying a very clear component. And we actually also time and announce in advance the turning point and so on. Not, of course, deterministically, but with some window and so on. This is the summary, I would say, of the preparation of the last decade before the, I would say, the turning point somewhere in the middle of 2007 to mid-2008 of the global bubble. This is a PC analysis uh, of a kind of an index which is gathering market equity index, worldwide freight indices, soft commodities based on pressure middle and energy and currencies that shows the same type of behavior and the same type of analysis and so on and so forth. So our view of, world, of the world is that there are dynamical change, dynamical regimes. Uh, we can identify the unstable ones. They occur at all time scale. This is another example which um, we uh, actually traded extremely successfully. This is a case which is extremely rare. It's so nice that you could time to within the minute in this case, but it's super rare. There was a, and this is the type of analysis we do. There was a clear also advance warning on the Swiss franc versus the euro. We see this at time scale of decades, years, to weeks, to you know, various markets, could be VIX market, could be a repo market, could be commodities market, to scales intraday, to all the way to the time scale of minutes or below. And I just want to yeah, uh, spend a few minutes on what is this endogeneity, reflexivity, and um, positive feedback at the time scale of intraday to cast a complementary review on the flash crash and the type of instability that we have heard about uh, in several talks today. So this is a methodology that we have developed with uh, Vladimir Filimonov to uh, characterize really what we uh, call the level or index of endogeneity or reflexivity, if you like, which is this N here, where we use um, a self-excited conditional uh, personal process. It's called the hoax process, which has been also used in the last few years by people interested in uh, contagion in credit crisis in order to actually identify how much of the trades are due to news, so exogeneity, versus past trades, basically. And what we see is that globally, we have an estimation that nowadays, 
85 to 90 percent of the trades we think are endogenous in nature globally, of which 80 to 90 percent are due to short term mechanism. So, this is a rough a cartoon to understand the model. Uh, this is basically the idea that we have news impacting real, real informative or uh, process, um, uh, events that are taken into account, that move the market, and then you have a kind of cascades uh, uh, depicted by these arrows, and we have this uh, endogeny parameter, which is either less than one, then the system is subcritical, one, meaning critical, means that most of the activity of the trading is due to endogeneity in absence of the need of any news impacting the system. So this has been applied and we have calibrated the response function to dynamics of uh, fame like YouTube video and this has uh, been extremely successful to understand what uh, is the dynamic around the peak, let's say, of views on YouTube, book sale dynamics or even financial stocks comparing volatility spikes uh, at different time scales, uh, EXO being the coup against Gorbachev of the September 11th, and though being most of the, uh, the rest of the time. So this is a view of the analysis and I would just want to focus here on the long-term uh, variation of this uh, index of uh, endogeneity, which we find when calibrated at the intraday time scale, goes from 30% to maybe 80% or 70 to 80% in present time. And this is very interesting because now we are collaborating with the United Nations to analyze uh, the same thing for commodities. And we see that for commodities, we have seen this growth of endogeneity here uh, as a function of time, both for oil or for um, soybean, corn, sugar, wheat, and so on, where uh, something like 60, 70, 80, with spikes at close to 100% of the activity due to um, endogeneity as opposed to real fundamental news. Now, what about the flash crash? When you do the same analysis and estimate and calibrate this model to the flash crash of May uh, 6, 2010, and compare with a similar sized event, so this shows you the price, the volume, and the trade rate of these two events, which just occurred separated by a few weeks, you find everything is almost the same, except in terms of this endogeneity um, measure, uh, and indeed, uh, April 27, that was the first time when the cr crisis of Greece became on the radar, became on the radar of the investors, while May was really already clearly on the radar, and we find in our um, uh, analysis um, very similar, as I said, volume and trading activity, but the branching ratio of this uh, endogeneity index shows a few minute precursory early warning. Behavior. And what is interesting, then, when you start to uh, do some um, uh, systematic analysis and you look at a measure of size uh, in a systematic way, like here, the distribution of drawdowns, this peak to valley at the time scale of intraday, second by second, for example, you find the fat tail structure, as usual, and you find a few events which are of enormous size, which do not extrapolate to the distribution that has been calibrated by the, to the smaller events. And these events are systematically exhibiting this type of behavior with the precursor behavior in the endogeneity parameter. So this gives rise to a very interesting uh, possibility of having advanced warning of the kind of uh, phrasing of the market, like a, a kind of contagion and endogeneity. And we are developing a system for the Monet Monetary Authority of Singapore for this, because they are very interested in uh, stabilizing. Now, in the last five minutes, I think I have five, five more minutes, five, ten, yeah? Uh, it's slipping, yeah? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> five, ten minutes, yeah? Uh, I would like to use this to <clears throat> uh, both uh, cast a view of how we understand the crisis. I mean, okay, so we have, there have been a global bubble and so on, but where does it come from? And then to use this as an opportunity to show how it works um, in other cases where we see the development of bubbles in action. So the view uh, we have come up with uh, by putting together all this research and these empirical um, investigations is that basically we can think of several phases. Uh, we have to go back, I think, to have a correct view of what is going on now to the post-World uh, War II event where we had this uh, Marshall Plan of reconstruction, the boom uh, in the US, the consumerism, that led to real productive gains and wage uh, saturation. And then we had a, a regime of transition with the Bretton Woods uh, system termination, the all shock, the inflation shock. 
And then really, what is interesting, by the way, in this uh, thing is that this was accompanied by a liberalization, legal deregulation, privatization agenda. This uh, was all over the world with a kind of global pattern in the US, UK, China, India, developing uh, with a kind of um, consensus, which is called the Washington Consensus, that is underpinning this third period, which is roughly of a bit less than 30 years, which are summarized as the illusion of the per perpetual money machine and growth of virtual wealth. I'm going to come back to this. Simply illustrated by this accounting uh, calculations, if you like, um, where the bottom gra graph shows in percentage of GDP, here you can see 64% of GDP, the wage um, cumulative for Europe, US, and Japan, compared with consumption. Uh, so this is way, sorry, in gray, and the consumption is the dark uh, dots here. And what you see is that since 1960 to 19, mid-1980s, you, you, you see what you expect. Wages, incomes, is larger than consumption. But then there is a change of regime, where suddenly consumption really grows, while wages plateau or go down. You have really a problem. Consumption, expenditure, became larger than wage. And what happened is explained by the top graph, which shows that indeed saving plateaued or went a little bit down, but the rate of profit on investment, be they uh, stock market, uh, different financial support, real estate, start to, in aggregate, to grow and to basically compensate. And this is, of course, the common story of the extraction of wealth from, let's say, in the last uh, time of the expansion. Uh, before 2007 of the renegotiation of mortgage and equity extraction. Now the question of course is how can a country or an economy which is, and you see these data for about 50 years or a bit more, where at least in the mid 60s the growth rate in real term of GDP of the US has been in this narrow, in this narrow corridor of a growth of about 3%, how can an economy like this promise a rate of return of investment, financial investment, and so on, of, let's say, 15% a year. Probably transiently, yes, but on a long-term stationary sustainable regime, that's a virtual impossibility, and this can be supported by, by various accounting and dynamical calculation that I don't have time to present, but will be happy to discuss uh, privately if you want. So we have now a transition, clearly, that uh, to another regime of absurd growth fueled by quantitative easing, and uh, experience in real life of central bank and treasury action with very low rate for a very long time. That's our uh, analysis, net erosion of value, even in the present of uh, disguised low inflation, reassessment of expectation for social and right retirement liabilities, very turbulent futures because of this uh, um, liquidity permeating the system and the creation of many transient bubbles, as we have seen 2010, 2011, I was showing you a few cases. And the need to capture value and to be contrarian, which requires completely new ways of investing. Beyond that, there will be even worse uh, situation with the interconnection of many systemic risks. But let me go back to this illusion of the perpetual money machine and try to understand these 30 years uh, in the preparation of this. We see these 30 years as basically the uh, combination of seven massive bubbles. We had the worldwide bubble, 1980. This is roughly the beginning. It, start, it started slow, but then accelerated until October 1987. Then the ITC.com bubble, 1995, according to analysis to 2000, the Risted bubble which we time roughly at 2003 to 2006 with a culmination which actually came earlier in the UK, mid-2006 in the uh, US. The financialization bubbles, MBS, CDOs bubbles, that was developed concomitantly. The stock market bubble, very clear signals. And commodities out bubbles as well as debt bubbles. Now, sh let me show you this in quantitative terms, in graphs. Okay, 25th anniversary of this great crash. You see our calibration dot line of the price where uh, this is post-mortem. Most of the analysis I'm going to show you are ex-ante. This is ex-post. Um, this is the first signal, in our opinion, of the change of regime to this virtual perpetual money machine, which is the preparation for the Great Recession and the problem in getting out of this crisis by the piling up of a bubble. 
uh, we had this um, uh, Nasdaq crash uh, here at the, at the end following several years of exploding uh, returns. We had this real estate uh, bubble in the UK and the US. This has been also published ex ante, and we make a diagnostic of this bubble and the time of the end of the bubble. I should say that for the real estate, there is no crash in price. There is a crash in volume, simply due to the stickiness. So you should not, I mean, compare in the same way. This is the diagnostic, also ex ante, that was published two year, one year and a half before actually this actually happened in the so uh, approximately 20 uh, states in the US which were exhibiting bubbles, you know, according to our methodology. And uh, this is a, a case Schiller Home Price Index that showed the price appreciation more than doubling in uh, a few years. And you don't need actually any calibration to support this idea that the bubble is corresponding, in this case at least very clearly, to not only an exponential growth, but to growth of the growth rate. So this is not my work, this is just the analysis of the return of the cash Schiller index, the relative variation of the case. And what you see is that an exponential growth should be a constant on this graph. It is not a constant, it's been growing itself. Which is the reflection, according to the model and our understanding of this positive feedback. The growth of securitization and financialization, the growth, the bubble on um, the stock market, very clear also. Uh, commodity, I was already mentioning, various bubbles all over the place. The uh, signature in terms of the abnormal relationship between uh, inventory and price, very clear over this period in 2007-2008. The uh, also debts bubble, very, very clear. Wealth extraction, even documented by Greenspan and Kennedy in an academic paper, where the peak $1 trillion was extracted yearly. And when you remove this market extraction, there's been, it's been estimated that actually the growth of GDP has to be scaled down very significantly to basically zero. You have this extremely interesting view uh, summarized by this McKenzie study showing that the US household debts as a percent of gross disposable income, you see, has grown from 40% roughly in mid-50s to a peak exceeding 120, 120%. And they conclude, you see, there's a long-term trend, and we are halfway in 2011, when they, uh, 2012, early 2012, when they did this study, uh, halfway back to normal. What is very interesting in this is that you see the spirit, the bubble spirit in the depths, because you all should be shooting and standing on your feet looking at this graph. Because what does it show? It shows that the normal thinking now, the new normal, is to think that depths has to grow. While here, from the mid 60s to the mid 80s, the average debts, uh, household debts, was at the matrix level, 60%, if I just make an analogy with the level of debts for the countries. And, but nevertheless, that's the spirit of the world, of the new epoch, of thinking that the debts as a new normal and should grow without limit. So actually, they say, okay, we are not so far from normal and back to normal. And then, of course, the various measures of exploding debts, uh, measure of the GDP in the US and elsewhere, and the global bubble that I already mentioned before. So, in order, and so this is the main conclusion that I want to leave with you with, is that in order to really appreciate the sore, um, the dire uh, state in which we are, we have to uh, digest that basically the last 25 to 30 years have been before 2007 have been the best ever, arguably, in the US, in any part of the world, but have been bought at the cost of enormous bubbles, one after the other and concomitantly, that have been basically giving the impression of gains of productivity and gains of wealth, which have been illusions by a big part. Not, complete, not all, of course, but by a big part. And so having this point of view, uh, I think, recast the uh, discussion of what to do. Most of the discussion and the attempts are about keeping the status quo, which is based on absolutely unsustainable regime, which we have taken as the norm, but which were bought at the cost of successing debts. So to finish, yeah, so I, I think I can finish this and uh, leave the uh, floor for discussion. I'm sure that there will be a lot of uh, uh, criticism coming up. I will be happy to try to answer to them. Thank you.
Well, I, I thought that was a very interesting uh, presentation, but uh, I found particularly your idea that um, a lot of the trading activity in the market is endogenously generated by what goes on in the market itself, but I didn't understand exactly what was reacting to what. So uh, the way I think about it, you've got news hitting the market, and then I, I think that you have also bets hitting the market that may or may not be related to news. And then you've got the market responding to both the news and the bets by having various other people respond. So, um, so in your language, maybe you can shed some yeah. light on like, is it, is, is it trading responding to trading or trading responding to news? That's yes. So, so in your language, is bets responding to bets? Trading or responding oh, my, to trade. My language would be intermediation trades by various speculators taking the other side of the bets, responding to bets. Yeah, but yeah. Your language might be uh, just trading, responding to news, or trading, responding to trading. But specifically in the context of the flash crash, um, uh, Maureen O'Hara has this paper with co-authors that says that the flash crash could have been forecast quite a quite a while in advance. But I thought you, I heard you say just a couple of minutes in advance. So yes. I was ten minutes I was, in advance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was uh, I was ten minutes in advance of. Okay. So there's ten minutes in advance of what exactly? If you might shed some of, light on that. Yeah. That's yeah. That's um, of the, but, of the but peak. But at any yeah. rate, um, maybe explain how this uh, is it bets responding to news, bets responding to bets, trading responding to trading, and how does it play out in the flash crash? Yeah. Yeah. So for specifically for this um, fast high frequency trading, basically the model is estimated on the flow of trades. So that's what we estimate. Now, is it really what is happening? Don't know. But that's what the model estimates. So we take the, at the input of the model the trade order flow. So, the, so, so that would suggest that, that would suggest that the 10 minutes you're talking about is 10 minutes before the bottom of the flash crash. Or is it 10 minutes before halfway down the flash crash? So the trading started exploding around the time this large order started executing. So to me, it's like a bet starts executing and trading volume exploded. So that would just be, uh, and clearly the trading volume exploded by a factor of about 10 times greater than the, 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 bet, you know, the, the bet itself. So there was a lot of endogenous trade that was generated in response to that bet arriving, but I, I, it seems to me that that bet arriving should have sent the signal that something was going on that was weird. So, yeah, yeah. So. Um no, I have, for example, I have, have been a uh, dispute with Maureen O'Hara, which thinks that it's, it's coming from information flow and things like that. Uh, so what we see, so this can be maybe summarized by this graph, where you see basically this um, reflexity index behavior that stays b within this 95% confidence band, estimated on the previous 10 minutes. So we have a running window of 10 minutes. We estimate this um, endogeneity parameter, and we, con we compare it whether it goes outside this band, these cyclical bands. Okay, you see here in dashed lines, and you see that this can occur, uh, you know, a few minutes. It depends on the cases. We have not a systematic, of course, it's not uh, deterministic. It's a stochastic processes, process, but you see it goes before, actually, you see, for example, the, the crash here occur, occurs here, and already you could have said, aha, here, even at the first uh, little uh, blip that something was very fishy, because like something like, uh, we are going to more than 80-90% 80, of the trades are internal. I can't see what you're pointing to. You're pointing to 2001. So I'm showing different things. Huh? So, yeah. this is, so this is flash crash. So you see here again that the reflect index goes out of the statical band. Now, the, you have to make a decision. A prediction is you know, through a threshold, a probabilistic right. thing. We take a certain confidence interval of what is this index doing, then it goes abnormal. You see, it means that suddenly, like, the whole uh, dynamics was endogenous. What does it mean? It, there's, there's no news, nothing, everything is like the hot potato phenomenon. But your shaded area corresponds almost perfectly with the execution of the $4 billion, what I would call bet. Yes, yes, uh, and yes. The yes. arrival of that bet yes, is yes, also corresponds yes, very yes. closely to your yeah, arrival yeah, yeah, of yeah, the yeah, flash yeah. crash. But you see, we see the dynamics which become endogenous this time. Still on this figure, because I mean, if I look really at the flash crash, which I mean, on the top right and bottom right uh, graph, uh, the, the peak is really when the crash is already there. So it, a good moment to stop, for example, it may imagine that you want to go to interrupt the stock market, might have been the second point, which if I understand Ben, is something like five or six standard deviations with, I mean, you, you said it's 95% confidence, right? So it's presumably roughly, say, plus or two minus two standard deviations. So it, if the distribution of the signal was normal, it would be something like five standard deviations. So the 
quest, which would be great if it is really normal because it doesn't happen so often. So the, the question is, have you made a test of how many false positives you have? So this is uh, ongoing work. Huh? We have not yet published this paper. We have not just even finished this paper. So the way we're doing is exactly this summar summarized at this graph. You see, um, how do you identify these events? I mean, so you have to collect them. So one way we did is summarized here. We look at all possible, uh, let's say, drawdowns. So you have to decide, you know, wh what is a crash again? So we define it as a peak to bottom, like a drawdown, okay? We look at the distribution you see here, and we look at the abnormal. So what we are doing, doing now is looking, let's say, at these events and showing, and preliminary results show that the uh, endogeny index stays in the band, while the extreme cases apparently have a different behavior where you see this uh, uh, band of behavior, and then it goes out of the band and then comes back, corresponding to suddenly a shoot up of endogeneity. It's like intermittent criticality, we could, we could call in, in math or in physics. So it's, uh, when we saw this, we were, we were very happy. So we have not yet at the stage, and this is ongoing work, in a few weeks we have the full statistics of actually quantifying the, the false alarm. That's what we want to do, of course. But already you see that all the events in this tail as exhib are exhibiting this. While when you do um, analysis with running window, indeed the index remains in this band. So this is very encouraging, but we, we are uh, calculating the hard numbers uh, precisely. Uh, yeah, gold is in a, in a secular bubble, uh, or it's just a reflection that in, <laughs> inflation, <laughs> or there's a global liquidity bubble. Um, so we have, uh, for example, identified indeed very clear sign of bubbling behavior and uh, uh, let's say, intermediate size correction uh, in 2011. That was very clearly, and uh, as you know, it has going, gone sideways and then is now showing sign of resuming its activity and so on. So this is a case, and this is partly, uh, completely, uh, uh, can be accommodated very nicely in our framework that you have bubbles within bubbles within bubbles. So gold is a kind of large secular bubble in which smaller bubbles, like uh, Russian puppets, and actually, the full solution of the mathematics that I did not show you allows this, where you have singularities within singularities within singularities. So you cannot say there is a bubble in gold. The problem is that if you, I tell you, you say, okay, on the advice of Didier, I bought gold. Don't do that. Because the problem is that there's a lot of things going on. So you need, you need to do. So in a, in a nutshell, yes, there is a global bubble. We think in the gold, but there are shorter time scales. So the global bubble may be developing over the time scale of 10 years within which there are time scale of two years, within which there are time scale of six months, and so on. I cannot hear. Yes, yes, for the, for the, bubble, for the bubble and gold, yes. Yes, in 2011. Uh, regarding gold, uh, there is an instability that appeared uh, things, uh, simply due to the existence of the ETF. The ETF creates a feedback loop uh, on the, so, which creates a, a, an instability. Uh, I'd like to rebound on your conclusion uh, that we are, I mean, your scary conclusion that we are, you know, in, uh, in uh, the most, uh, the longest and the most uh, intense uh, bubble somehow. Uh, and you mentioned uh, during the talk uh, the discussion on the definition of a bubble. Uh, where uh, you gave an answer that was basically uh, not in the discussion. The discussion was whether people see bubble as a mispricing. So there is a supposedly true price and market price which departs from true price. And uh, people were fighting whether uh, it is the case or not. And you say, I don't care whether there is a true price or a mispricing. I identify the bubble by its dynamical properties. And that's why you say, eventually, I see the crash and so forth. And uh, in here, uh, that's a bit my question, because we are in a, in a situation which we can call unstable. Uh, but uh, the, 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 is there a mispricing? Is there another way of saying, is there a mispricing? Is there a way out of that instability without having a huge shift of the market? 
can we, can we make a write-off? And that's why I was saying, I was comparing uh, to this assignat period, uh, where we have this, this huge debt, and we can just say at some point, okay, well, it's no longer debt, let's call it anything else, but it's, it's paper uh, that is not meant to be refunded. Basically, it's a, matter, it's a way to say I'm making a write-off, and I'm restarting with a new way that would be a non-bubbling uh, behavior uh, to uh, depart from a very long period where we had you know, a big disbalance between northern and southern, uh, uh, south in the world, etc. So uh, that's why I mean, I want to see how, w what you mean by saying we are in a bubble, which is a kind of trap we cannot ex uh, exit from without a crash, or we are in a situation where we could deliver, I mean, we could get out of it. It's not a matter even of leverage, we can get out of it thanks to this crisis uh, by changing the rules, basically. Yeah, I'm not saying we are in a bubble now, uh, except that we are in a bond bubble and a <laughs> QE bubble and so on. And, uh, no, no, we are in the hangover period of drinking a lot of whiskey, uh, uh, vodka, and well, name it. And I have named them here. Okay, so um, now the point is that each of them, I mean, another way of phrasing the statement is then we look at this you have um, clearly a change of regime around 70, 80, where due to the gain of productivity, the wage plateaued or went down. And somehow the whole uh, uh, system, uh, it's clear that it's associated with um, policy makers who try to find a way, in particular with the three uh, US administration, to boost back the economy on its feet, given the, the deceleration that started to be very visible in the 70s by this policy encouraging access to property. And this is actually the probably one, if not the most uh, important f uh, factor for the whole process that I described in the last 30 years. The problem, of course, is uh, whether it is sustainable. And so we are actually seeing that each of this bubble has been um, let's say, uh, followed by crash or suffering, kind of uh, short-lived recession, which was immediately recovered through a next bubble. And so, um, actually, th there is a satirical journal called The Onion in the US, who, and I like very much, I have a slide usually that I show when I have time, which says, okay, the solution is very clear. We have to engineer the next bubble, the huge next bubble. So what it means, you can imagine whatever fancy thing, um, which is a half joke, because this is what has been going on for the last 30 years, that actually the growth has been engineered by. So what are the recipes that come out of this diagnosis? So my, my, my main goal has been to show you a little bit of what are the mechanism and the, and the, and the models, or give you a flavor, and then to have a diagnostic which is scary, I would say, much more scary than is discussed usually, because basically people stop as, at, yeah, the real state of the US and other UK stop to grow and this cascade in other problems. And there was this misconception and so on. So I'm, of course, I'm, I'm very sch schematic. But I think the real diagnostic, if you want really to solve and making it better, is uh, to go back to the, this diagnostic that goes in depth. So indeed, there's this question, uh, there's this quote of Harry Summer, I think I saw, I saw a few months ago in the Financial Times, where he said, the irony is that the cause of the bubble is due to over-indebtedness, overconfidence, overspending, and so on. The irony that the only solution to get out is over-indebtedness, uh, overconfidence, and overspending, and over debts. Um, so that's, that's a question. That's a question that goes to the model that we heard this morning, and so on. So um, when you read... Yes. So I, I think we have to stop, but just last, one last remark is um, I think we, we need to learn not only the lessons of the recent past, but uh, Reinhard Rogoff are very interested in this aspect, and we are doing a lot of this quantitatively with this methodology to look at these 800 years. But we can go back to 5,000 years of depth history, and I recommend, if you don't know this book, Depth by David Graeber. Five, so the title is Depths, the first 5,000 years. He's an anthropologist and historian who has basically looked, it's an enormous piece of work of scholarship uh, where he has looked at all civilizations in the 5,000 years in the, on the planet, China, Mesopotamia, 
uh, whatever, in Europe and so on, Africa. And he has found the same systematic behavior. And indeed, the solution has always been, I mean, first, depth, um, so growth by depth is always unstable. It's systematic, no exception. And the only way has been solved rapidly, and there are many very interesting cultural differences, and it's fantastic to see history in this way, is through forgiveness. And it's called, it was called the Jubilee, <laughs> where, and actually the depth was, uh, has been um, controlling everything. The unit of wealth for most of societies, even until 1911 in Ireland, was the young girl of 18 years old, which was sold as slave in order to be exchanged, and you had to, so, to sell your f children, to sell the, the, your, yourself, and so on. And every 25 years, to one or two generations, there was a jubilee where you were actually, um, you know, uh, effacer l'ardoise, you know, uh, washing out the, the, the account, and st starting from crash, free, freeing the, the slave, which have been actually the con um, concrete uh, consequence of the debts, and starting from zero. Right now, we are trying to keep the status quo, we are keeping all the resources, all the revenues start to keep the status quo, given the fact that the status quo has been created on a completely perpetual money machine illusion. So that's just a matter of thought. It's a, it's a social, societal choice that we have to make, basically. So there is no technical solution. It's a social solution, collective solution.